the phrase that we're up in Magadha is that if God had not taken us out of Egypt, then we and our children and our grandchildren would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. So what does that mean? We and our children and our grandchildren would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. So this is from Rabbi Sro of Chorchotov. Wow. He said, there are two dimensions to exile, our physical subjugation to the idolaters and our spiritual experience, acceptance of their values and their way of life. Hashem can take us out of the material exile. However, we alone can free ourselves from its spiritual counterpart. Nevertheless, had God, God not redeemed us with miracles and wonders, we would lack the strength and the awareness necessary to free ourselves from slavery to Egyptian ideals. So that's a very powerful phrase that we were, God could take us out of the material and we ourselves could take us out of the spiritual. We had a line today in the Daf Yomi. We said, who is free? Only somebody who has their own soul. But not show Kinuyolo. Only somebody whose own destiny is in their hands is somebody who's free. And so therefore, that's what it means. I'm sorry to you. Is this the meat? There's no meat. It's all power. It's all power. It's all power. It's, all power. it's, all power. it's vegan soup. Vegan soup. So then, so what? So, so, yes. So Rabbi, yes. This is, this is uh, Rashayahu Leibovitz. Oh, Yeshayahu Leibovitz? Yeah. You see? Oh, wow. Where did you get that? We have a copy too. Well, this is my copy. Oh, okay, beautiful. So he writes a, a parish in Saab. He says, the Riyama says that there's something very profoundly singular that's being taught yeah. in, uh, from Yemiyahu, from the Haftorah. Right. He says, what is what is Hashem? He says, walk in all my ways that I have commanded. What is Hashem commanding us? He says, uh, we do not find any reference to the story in the Exodus. So he says that the most significant issue, he says, was in, in the history is the law of governing, freeing the slaves in the seventh year. So the terrible sin of the people of Zedekiah was while they did free their slaves, they immediately afterwards seized them for another term of slavery. Right, and that's what that, that says because exactly. of this, Jeremiah right. Says this is this caused the destruction of Yerushalayim, king and the people. One of the harshest prophecies of the of Yermah was a prophecy of destruction. So he says, so this is this is the reminder. He says, This is the reminder that 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 people have this is the covenant, he says, Hashem made. That's beautiful. That, that, that you can't have freedom for the Jews and not have freedom, you know, for for sit at the table and we're free. While well, well, the people are being enslaved that's the exact, next day. That's exactly right. That's why the first mitzvah, we saw this, uh, was the, the given to the Jewish people was they have to free their slaves. That's what we saw by Tzavei Mabene Israel that the commentary say, the Yerushalmi says the first mitzvah was to free the Jewish, for the Jewish people had to free their own slaves before we could be freed from Egypt. Exactly yeah, like you're saying. Here. Because it, it's, it's a very, very paradoxical situation. How the heck can you, can you say, okay, you got a furlough from jail now, yeah. which is slavery. Yeah. And next day you go back and then you, and you put them right back in. I mean, that, that's, that's exactly. He said Hashem doesn't like that kind of that kind of movement because he said that that's you were slave and your slave have to be free just like you are. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Shkoyach. And now the next line uh, states: "Vafil kuanu chachamim, kuanu nevonim, kuanu zakenim, kuolu yodim es Torah mitzvahin lasapar b'tzias mitzrayim." Even if we were all wise and all elderly and we all know the Torah, it's a mitzvah for us to tell the story of the Exodus. So what does this mean? What is even if we're all wise? Because the mitzvah is not for us to gain some sort of intellectual understanding of the mitzvah. The mitzvah is for us to internalize the mitzvah. And that doesn't come from, from a state of mind. That comes from experiencing it every year. It has to be an experiential mitzvah. That's what we're saying. That it's a mitzvah to also to tell the story. It's not a mitzvah for us to know it. It's a mitzvah for us to tell the story. That we have to pass it on to the next generation. It's a mitzvah for us to tell the story. So, so this is what Rabbi, Rabbi Yerachmiel Yisrael of Alexander says. He says, why would one think that the wise men would not be obligated? Why would somebody think that the wise men would not be obligated? So this passage is emphasizing that the Seder's goals are experiential. Each Jew should feel, that's exactly what I was saying. 
Each Jew has to feel himself leaving his personal Egypt. That is the influences which constrain and limit his Jewish expression. We have to share it. So a wise man may feel satisfied with himself and fail to appreciate the necessity of leaving his own Egypt, especially if you're wise. You think, I'm not in Egypt. Look, I, I know all the answers. No, each of us has to leave the places that are holding us back from, from experiencing a pure spirituality. That's the whole essence of it. That's beautiful. That's the essence of it. Exactly right. Wow. And, and the mitzvah is not just to understand it, but to tell it. Do you know how you tell a story? You have to tell the next generation. It's our job to, to pass it on the next generation. It's our job to pass on the story, not only to the next generation, but even to the parallel generation. We have to all be, be empowered with this responsibility to teach. And so the Passover Seder, uh, so the Hebrew word says, Rabbi Avram of Slonim, the son of Rebbe says, says the Hebrew word to, to tell also means to shine. Lesaper can also mean to shine, to, to shine. The Passover Seder should not remain merely an intellectual experience, it should affect our souls to the point that their inner light shines forth. You have anything there? That's beautiful. And then it says, And whoever, in, whoever tells the story of the Exodus, whoever tells it more and more and more, is praiseworthy. Um, so, so Moshe of Kabrin says that praiseworthy doesn't mean, it doesn't mean just worthy of praise, Meshubach can also mean is improved. The more we tell the story of the Exodus, the more we're improved, the better we do. So, okay. Megillah, here's a, a comment from the Ger Rebbe, that the Gemara Megillah tells us that we're not supposed to praise such. By the way, Rabbi Yosef, can you check on Safaria if there is a commentary, Rashi commentary on the Haggadah? Because I never saw one. I wonder if there is. Anyway, the Ger Rebbe says that the Gemara Megillah tells us we're not supposed to praise God excessively in general. Because the more we praise God, we're actually criticizing God. Because if you say God is, God, is, God is smarter than Leonardo da Vinci, that's actually a limitation of God's greatness. To it say that God like is... A, what? doesn't look like it. Isn't that so interesting that there's Rashi on everything... Has anybody ever published a Rashi Agada? I, I saw a Maharal Agada. I saw. Oh, uh, yeah, there's uh, thousands of Agadas, but has anybody ever published a Rashi Agada? I think, I'm not sure. I think I saw one downstairs. Like you mean Rashi on the verses and then Rashi on the Midrash and then Mishra. Yes. Uh, yeah, you'd have to go through all the, you'd have to know all the places. Where this thing was cross-sighted, and if there's a comment from Rashi on it, like for example, what would what would have Rashi said? Okay, so so, but here in this case, in this case, an exception is made, and we're allowed to comment on Rashi. Excuse me, we're allowed to praise God because because this purpose of the story is to tell us that we know that 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 this is Hashem. To know of Hashem's greatness. Okay, so, okay, now, uh, uh, so now we're up to the next line. The next line tells us, my said uh, there was a story. Oh, did you have something to add, Brad Meyer? Okay, the next line tells us one of my favorite parts of the Agadah is there was an incident. Do you want Agadah, Ken? Oh, you have one. Okay, my so there was an incident for Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Elazar ben Azari, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Tarfon. There's an incident with these with these rabbis, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Elazar ben Azari, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Tarfon. These five rabbis. Shayu Mesubin, Mesubin the Bnei Brak. Like the five of us are sitting around here, they were sitting around in Bnei Brak. And they were telling the story of the Exodus, Koloso Halayla, that entire night. Which night? They were telling the story of the Exodus the whole night of Pesach. They were sitting around these five great sages, presumably because the previous passage just told us that, that 
that he, no matter how wise you are, no matter how, no matter how much Torah you know, no matter if you're elderly or Navonim, all of these categories, you need to tell the story. And these, these sages fit this story. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they were sitting around. They were telling the story of the Exodus the entire night. And while they're sitting there telling the story, until their students came, the Amruam, and they said to them, Rabbi Seinu, our rabbis, he gias man kriyashma shal shachris. The, the time for the Shema of the morning has arrived. So this is a very powerful story. Just before we read some of the commentary on it, I always understood this as they're sitting there, they're sitting there, and this was usually, I understood this as taking place during the Par Kochba revolt. The Jewish people were under attack. They were under attack. And so therefore, there was a time of tremendous darkness. So they were telling the exit of the story the whole night. They were in the middle of the darkness and they were trying to tell them that there's darkness all around us. You know, we're in, the, but, but don't give up. Don't give up in the midst of this darkness. They're telling the story of the exodus the whole night while there's darkness. They're telling them until the students finally said, exactly the time for the morning Shema has arrived. The dawn has come upon us. The dawn has come upon us. We see a path towards redemption. Now, you understand what I'm saying, Ramayer? They were sitting there and telling, they were trying to be mechazik, they're telling me them. They were sitting there all night long. Night is a symbol of darkness. And they're sitting there and they're saying, don't worry, because there was once a time where the Jewish people were in exile, where we were exiled, where we had no hope where we were sitting there in darkness and they're telling them the story of how Moshe Rabbeinu let us out and it can happen again to us until their students came and said, yes, you're right. The time of the Shachras has arrived. The time for redemption has come. What do you think about that, Rabbi Yosef? You like that? Okay, thank you, thank you. So, well, I'll ask, uh, he always speak you know, loudly, let everyone hear. He always asks, you know, very direct questions and very... Uh, down to earth natural questions. So his question is very simple. He says, what right did these Chachomem, he says, well, what right did they have to impose this extreme stringent discomfort upon the Jewish people? Because let's face it, I mean, you know, if you crunch the numbers as they say nowadays, yeah, how many people stay up all night discussing? Now, I'm not saying that there aren't many, there are right. hundreds of thousands. Right. The majority, you know, it, it says in, in, the, in the, 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 there are certain parameters to a, to a holiday. It's where you're supposed to rejoice. What kind yeah. of rejoicing is it? You're trying to put toothpicks on your eyelids and yeah. you're trying to come up with topics and then you're drinking wine and then. And you and, and and your chin is hitting the table. So and what, like, no, so what, what, what's going on here? Exactly. Where, where's the rejoicing in this? Uh? So so Barbanel says, well, he says, what what the situation here is that you're having an an exact replica, a reenactment of the very first sale. He said the Jews were working all night long. They were preparing matzah. Oh, they were beautiful. packing their bags. They were, and it was like this, this, this whole tribal, I mean, we're tribal. It was a whole national enthusiasm. He says, we're leaving tomorrow, you know, and left, you know, and they were singing and dancing as they were doing and it. And then it came time to leave. And this, this, and this self-torture, every torture, quote unquote, actually was a work of joy because they, were, they, they knew that this is exactly what our ancestors did in a state of joy. And, yes. says, and therefore, it, it re-energizes you when you do it correctly. When you, I love when you that. Do it that way. I love that, that they, they were reenacting the initial Seder. I saw something similar from Menachem Mendel of Rimenoff, exactly like Meyer was no. saying in the name of the Barbanel, that they brought together their different experiences to, to tell us about the oneness of the Jewish people. Right. And now, did I, did I cut you off, Meyer? No, nope, oh, not at all. So, B'nai Brach. So, therefore, here, What's the term? Why is B'nai Brak being mentioned here? Uh, this is from the O of Yisrael, Rav Abraham Joshua Heschel, Rav Avram Yoshua Heschel, the, the, the O of Yisrael from Apt. Oh, come join us. We're talking about the Agada, John. Please have a seat here. Rav Shmuel, sit, have a seat. We're talking about the Agada. So he says that Rabbi Akiva was the rabbi of B'nai Brak. Oh, I thought you said nope, Jeff. You said nope. 
Oh, you mean nope to the grapes? Yes. Yes, yes to the grapes or nope? I did not touch the grapes, did not see the grapes. So, oh, there's grapes in the refrigerator. John, can you bring the grapes out of the refrigerator? So we don't know. Somebody snuck into the yeshiva this afternoon and put down a bowl of grapes. Oh, really? No, Looks like two bowls of grapes in there. It's two bowls there. Yeah. Yeah. John is the, the um, cooker of the soup, by the way. So no, oh. This soup was made by Ronnie. Oh. This, this soup was made by wrong. Ronnie. Yeah. Yeah. Man, right. John, makes John makes great soup. But the question is, who brought the grapes? Anyway, we don't know. We don't know who brought the grapes, but whoever you are out there, you're great. You're great. So <laughs> you're not sour. So Rabbi Akiva was the so rabbi. Rabbi Akiva was the rabbi of B'nai Brak, and so the other sages joined him there for the Seder. However, beyond the fact, beyond that fact, there's a deeper implication in the mention of that city. Yoma uses the term Barkai, Yoma 28a, where the, the Kohen would stand at the base of Mikdash on the roof and he'd be of the wall. And he's, well, as soon as he sees the morning dawn, he'd shout out, Barkai! John, did you bring the grapes in this morning? Are you the one who do, donated the grapes? The secret elf? But uh, so, um, so night is used as a metaphor for exile. By the way, John, the soup is Ronnie's. Could you taste some? Delicious. Yeah. So night is used as a metaphor for exile, dawn for the messianic age. The stage has endured the entire night of exile, attempting to break through to the messianic dawn. This was the message told to them by their students. The time of the Shema, the time to proclaim the divine unity to be revealed in the messianic era had come. You know, this is the same shot I basically gave, but he connects it to the word B'nai Brak and Barkai, morning. Amen, amen, amen. So uh, I think I was mechaving to the idea of the O of Yisrael, that, that that's what the students are saying. The students are saying the morning dawn. It's the time of the Mashiach. You're telling us this whole story. You're telling us this whole story, but the time of the Mashiach has arrived. The time of the Mashiach. The time of the Mashiach has arrived. So why? So now says Rabbi Yeshua Bells, why did they wait until their students came? Why didn't they notice that the sun had begun to shine? Uh, so it says of Yeshua of Bells as follows. This is such a beautiful explanation. The sages were shining. The sages were shining. They're not with the light already of the redemption. Their students came to tell them that their influence was felt in the world at large. The time for the recitation of the Shema, the proclamation of Hashem's oneness had arrived. So what's the Shema? The Shema is the recitation of Hashem's oneness. And the students were saying, the time has come. The world is noticing it. Beautiful, what a beautiful explanation. Now the whole world is going to say Hashem is one. I saw Deborah send something and then Rabbi Yosef. Rabbi Yosef. Deborah, what did you send us? I don't have time to click on it. What did you say? The Rashi commentary on the Haggadah. Is that an actual Rashi commentary? Let me see that. Yeah, it's from Chabad. Oh, wow. Let's see, what do they say? A Rashi commentary on the Haggadah. Oh, so what they did was Ah, I have to get this. Okay, beautiful. I th thank you, Deborah. Excellent. I have yeah, to it's really interesting. I, I want to read it to you. Yeah, very good. We have to see what I think what they did was that they that they took all the verses that are quoted in the Haggadah, the 30 plus verses, and they wrote down what Rashi says about each of those verses, and then they uh -huh. put it in the book. That's exactly yeah, what I that we have to. We have to print up that book and study it. Okay, uh, uh, Rabbi Yosef, yes. Just uh, this line that you, mitzvah, and all that, it's not in a pasuk, it's not even in a gemara, so, um, so there wouldn't be a Rashi on it. Anyway, what I want no, no, to say... No, not on that line, but the verses that right. are cited right. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In terms of the why they didn't know that there was light, I always were told was told that it was during the Roman oppression, and so they were in a cellar. They weren't. They they didn't see the light of day. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's another explanation that they were they were so much in the dark they couldn't see the light that was going on. They couldn't see the light because they were in the cellar. Sometimes one generation is so immersed in the darkness it takes the next generation to come and show them the light. And this is like the idea that all the revolution and the redemptive practices come from the come from the youth because the youth are too uh, stupid to know better. And they are the ones who, who bring about the revolution. So the teachers were stuck there in the darkness all night. But the next generation, the students, the children, they came along and they said, our teachers, come on, get up. It's the time for the morning. Uh, uh, so the Alter Rebbe says, the Alter Rebbe says that, what does it mean the time for Shema has arrived? When the Jew proclaims Hashem is one, he steps beyond the limitations of material reality and his soul unites in God's oneness. This is an exodus from Egypt. So reciting the Shema is our, Ramayar, listen to this, says the author Rebbe, reciting the Shema is our soul's exodus from Egypt. Our soul is leaving, every time we recite the Shema, our soul is leaving our Egypt because we're declaring God's O Malchus Shemayim, the yoke of God upon us. Well, beautiful, beautiful, powerful idea. Every, every time we recite the Shema. Also, they say in the name of the mayor of, of Zhikov that what's the powerful phrase here? Until their students came forward and the students said, Rabbi Seinu, our teachers. Usually a teacher, a student is so loyal to their teacher. My teacher is better than you. My teacher is better than you. But they came forward and they said, all of us. They didn't say. He says, in this instance, the students were so permeated by the feelings of oneness that they didn't just show respect to their teacher. They were able to appreciate the greatness of the other sages and address them collectively as our teachers. Powerful idea. Powerful idea. So let's just see what the Nitzv says here. Says the Nitzv. What does he say here? Okay, Oh, Narbe Lisa. Ah, even though it's along the same lines, it says even though Rabbi Tarfon was older than Rabbi Akiva, and it, remember we saw in the Gemara Suvos, some people said that Rabbi Tarfon was Rabbi Akiva's teacher. Nevertheless, he's counted last because he was in B'nai Brak, and that's where Rabbi Akiva was. So we see from here, whoever is the rabbi in that place takes precedence over all the other people, even though the other people are older. All right, so my friends, we'll stop the recording here, and we'll let us pray the Mincha prayer. Let's pray the Mincha prayer. Okay.